internet, welcome to Film Theory, where I can't waste any more time getting to the finale of this theory because I keep literally being stopped in the streets and asked what the deadliest movie is going to end up being. It's actually a little unsettling how into this theory everyone is. Plus, the process of getting through these last five excruciatingly historically inaccurate movies is going to take us so long that I literally don't have any time to waste today. No witty banter, no cringy dad jokes, just death death, and even more death. Remember, we ended last episode with our total kill count sitting at 3,520. I had forgotten to add in two at the end of the last episode. Those 3,520 deaths were coming across 53 movies. The top of our deadliest Disney movie leaderboard belonged to The Lion King. Sitting confidently atop Pride Rock in a pile of bones with 1,660 lives lost. Mostly due to a half a decade of hyenas overfeeding. But get ready! because today's challengers are gonna give that number a heck of a run for its money. When we started in on this trilogy, everyone on our theorist team picked the movie that they thought was gonna end up being the deadliest. It was like guessing the weight of a new baby before it's born, except instead of pounds and ounces, it's beheadings and extinction level events. Hopefully your pick made it as a finalist because this is your last chance to get those bets in. Your final five internet, Mulan, Dinosaur, Hercules, Atlantis, or Moana. Or heck, maybe it's just gonna stay the line King. Choose wisely because lives, and more importantly, internet bragging rights, depend on it. Let's start with what is bizarrely the most straightforward of these final five, Mulan, which was a clear fan favorite for Death Count in the comments. And I understand why. I mean, you literally see two villages burned, an army of good guys just outright dead in the snow, and the climax of the whole thing is, as we all remember, Mulan using fireworks to cause an avalanche that buries all but six of the invading Hun army. Initially, I thought the best way to do this would be to just look at history. Mulan the Disney movie, in case you didn't know, comes from the Chinese legend of Hua Mulan, where the female warrior Mulan does what the movie would teach us to expect her to do. She takes her aging father's place in the army to defend against invaders. Interestingly enough though, this is a really progressive story. In the original legend, she doesn't hide her true self from her family or sneak away in the middle of the night. Her family totally supports her decision to become a kick-butt warrior woman, and she doesn't even need to fall in love with another soldier. I mean, I get that Disney needed to create some kind conflict or something, but the 5th century historical version of this story is actually a lot cooler and a lot more progressive than the 1998 remake. Feels bad, man. Given that it's a legend, maybe based in some history, I thought we could estimate deaths based on the number of soldiers in Shen Yu's real army. But Shen Yu isn't a real person. If anyone, he's sort of super loosely based on Attila the Hun, but geographically, Attila's empire ended 3,000 miles west of the Northern Wei Empire, where the Mulan legend originates, and most of his battles were fought against Europeans. So we got ourselves the wrong enemy at the wrong end of the continent. So there were really no Attila battles that I could base this on. But I kept on trying. Shen Yu gets his name from the anglicized version of Shan Yu title, which is just the generic term for a Hun leader. It would be like watching a movie about America a thousand years from now, where the head of our country was somehow named Perez Odent. Given that Shan Yu is this totally generic title, there's still no battle that we could possibly base this finale of Mulan on. It also doesn't help us that there's no real historical record of Mulan. While her legend is really famous, she's usually left out of Chinese history texts, and seems to be treated like a symbol rather than a real historical person. So in the end, with not enough credible information to go on, I had to result to doing a death count the old-fashioned way, counting. Except that counting all these people the old-fashioned way would have taken a ridiculous amount of time, so I did it the new-fashioned way, a macro. Using GNU Octave, I processed the frames of Mulan to automatically count how large Shen Yu's horde was. The program converts the images into black and white, which in turn makes it easier for the computer to count the individual members of the army. I had to really fiddle around with the settings here to make sure that the program only was counting what I wanted it to, soon to be dead hunts. After some creative photoshopping, I came out with 11 deaths on the mountainside by aggressive firework, plus an additional 178 horsemen and 1,048 other soldiers in the avalanche itself, for a grand total of 1,237 kills. Add to that the two villages that we see burned, 
which, based on the size and proximity to the Great Wall of China, would have had about 100 residents each, as well as the army that gets massacred trying to surprise attack Shen Yu, which we can count in these scenes to be 31, but actually only adds 30 deaths since one messenger survives the massacre. How many men does it take to deliver a message? One. And then Shen Yu himself, we get ourselves a grand total of 1,468. It's worth noting here that I've seen a few other different versions of this death count circulating around online, ranging anywhere from 260 to the upwards of 2,000. I was as absolutely exhaustive in this analysis as possible, so I feel pretty darn good about that 1,468 number, but in the end, it still doesn't edge out Lion King. With Mulan out of the way, it's time to move on to the last of our movies, in the princess category, going from Mulan in China-ish to Moana in Polynesia-ish. After this, it's all gods and natural disasters, so Moana is gonna be our last hope for a princess to take home the murder crown. Ramatala becomes death number one early on in the movie, and death number two quickly skyrockets to death number 260 when Maui and Moana blow up and sink an entire society of Kakamora. The little coconut pirates they meet in that totally forgettable scene that's just sandwiched in the middle of the movie. Anyway, those little scamps are based on a Solomon Islands legend of the Kakamora, a race of very small people who would steal from island tribes. They're always depicted as cute and harmless, which is clearly why Moana and Maui feel it necessary to sink 259 of them, at my best count, mercilessly into the ocean and then smile about it to each other as they sail away, leaving no survivors in their wake. We did it! Brutal. Okay, that's 260. It's certainly a bloodbath, but it is far from record-breaking. But now we get to the curse. The whole movie hinges on the fact that Maui stole this powerful Heart of Tefiti and thereby brought about a thousand-year plague. Without her heart, Tefiti began to crumble, giving birth to a terrible darkness that will continue to spread until every one of us is devoured by inescapable death. That means that Maui would be responsible for a thousand years of darkness spreading across the Pacific Islands, which seems like it should be a shoe-in for death and destruction. I am certainly excited. Now, we do have to remember that except for a single crab god, animal species aren't sapient in this movie, so fish aren't gonna count. And as much as I'd like to think that that leaves us with plenty of room for death, the problem with this curse quickly becomes the fact that it's just now showing up to Moana's island, which means that it has been coming for a long time. Sure, Grandma's map at the beginning of the movie shows this darkness spreading really fast, and yet when Moana and her dad visit the top of the island, he shows her how long they've been living there without any issues. No darkness to contend with for, at my count, 12 generations. If we're being generous and say that a generation of leader is turning over every 25 years, which again, Moana's dad looks significantly older than this, but we're giving it a worst case scenario, we're looking at at least 300 years of easy fish and coconuts without even a hint of a plague. I mean, if you have that long to become a doomsday prepper and you don't build in any contingency plans, I think there's an argument to be made that you might have had it coming. Anyway, the point is, we need to see if this darkness is actually creeping up on on anyone, or if it's just totally avoidable. To figure that out, we're gonna have to measure how far the curse has traveled, which we know is gonna be from the heart of Tefiti, where the curse started, to Moana's island at the start of the movie. So all we need to know is how far she travels in her boat between those two locations, and how long it takes to get there. Here's what we know. We see Moana travel for three, maybe four days at most. Her boat is captained by Maui, a master wayfinder and demigod, and her boat is a recreation of a Fijian kamikau, similar to an out rigger canoe that can travel up to 15 knots or 17 miles per hour. We're gonna somehow have to ignore the fact that this boat was also built by those 300 year old ancestors who landed on Moana's island, making this boat so impossibly old that there's no way it would actually sail, but whatever Disney. We'll also assume that Moana didn't sleep at any point during the journey, something Maui considered a sign of weakness as a wayfinder. So at the boat's max rate, steered completely straight by an expert wayfinder, she could sail 1,632 miles or 2,626 kilometers in four days, which is 
pretty incredible, but we're giving them the best case scenario. This means that Moana's Island is a little over 1,600 miles from the heart of Tafiti, or Curse Ground Zero. So okay, if the darkness started at Tafiti and is just now reaching Moana's Island at least 300 years later, we're saying that it took 300 years for the darkness to spread 1,632 miles, meaning that the curse has spread 5.4 miles per year. That is nothing. When you're standing on the shore of a beach, the horizon you're seeing is 2.8 miles away. From the top of Moana's Island, you would be seeing well over 12 miles into the horizon. You would literally see this darkness coming towards your shores for several years in advance, which is why Moana's deadliness just falls apart. With that much notice, it would be almost impossible to believe that seafaring Polynesian island dwellers who primarily fish for survival would be unable to, you know, get in their boats and sail to the next island over when they see the curse coming, thereby buying them a few extra years. Even Moana's tribe of people who are water phobic are still gonna have time to see their shriveled coconuts throw some flex tape onto those centuries old boats and move to the next island, which would buy them more time. So the final death tally for Moana, 261. Not even close. After a thoroughly disappointing performance by Moana, it's up to the last three movies to knock my socks off. And I'm confident in the next two, Atlantis The Lost Empire and Hercules. Sure, Atlantis The Lost Empire ain't one of those beloved Disney classics with the big plastic VHS cover, but looking back on it, it's pretty darn good. And at the very least, it is pretty darn deadly. And at this point, that's all I really care about. And since we're in the end game now, it's gonna need to prove itself in gladiatorial fashion against another strong challenger from the same part of the world, Hercules. In one corner, we've got ourselves a flood that wrecks an entire civilization, and in the other, we have ourselves a complete war between gods and titans with the world of man caught stuck in the middle. So let's set up those dueling death tickers and get down to it. Atlantis. There's a big chase scene with the Leviathan early on in the movie that accounts for 171 deaths right off the bat. Adding in the king's death and the ending battle, we suddenly jump up to 185. Though it can be hard to tell how many of the explosions we see signifying certain death and how many are just like pew pew pew, boom boom, as I believe is the technical term of what we're watching. Hercules. His kills are mostly taking place during the montage of him completing some of the most famous 12 labors of Hercules. Herc kills the Hydra, the Arimanthian Boar, the Nimian Lion, which looks suspiciously like Scar, a sea monster that isn't part of the labors, but we'll give him credit for anyway, and then the Minotaur, a Gorgon, and some really scary looking bird, two of which were actually fought by the Greek hero Perseus, but you get the idea. We can also give Hercules credit for killing Nessus, the centaur that's torturing Meg. It's unclear in the movie if he's officially dead or if he's just unconscious, but according to Greek myth, Hercules does indeed kill him, so we're gonna go with that. And no, we're not counting Meg. Sure, she dies, but she has to die and stay dead. Meg gets revived before the end of the movie. Also, you can't count Hades because he already lives in the underworld. So, based off of these early action sequences, Atlantis The Lost Empire has a significant lead. But at the end of the day, this isn't really gonna matter. Because these numbers are tiny compared to the huge catastrophic events in both movies. The sinking of Atlantis and the Titanomachy. And here's where the count has to get creative. Atlantis The Lost Empire starts with a giant tsunami headed for the island of Atlantis. A protective barrier bubble thing is formed around the center of the island and sinks it to the ocean. It's not as though everyone in Atlantis dies, but we do see a lot of people banging on that bubble from the outside, and the bubble only ends up saving just a small fraction of the land of Atlantis, which leaves us with an obvious question and a not-so-obvious answer. How many people people die when Atlantis sinks. It'd be nearly impossible to get a decent guess at this just from the design of the city that we see at the beginning of the movie, so we're gonna have to go all the way back to the ancient Greek Atlantis story to determine the most likely death toll. Ditto for when Hades releases the Titans onto Earth and they start wrecking house. Let's start with Atlantis. From a historical perspective, all our information about Atlantis comes from the Greek philosopher Plato. You know, the Plato who tells a story about a farmer who finds himself a ring that makes him invisible but corrupts him morally. A story that J.R.R. Tolkien definitely didn't steal. 
Anyway, in his dialogue Critias, Plato tells of the continent Atlantis, a 10,000 BC superpower with a great military and tons of technology so advanced that it sank because the gods got jealous and sent a big earthquake slash flood combo to take it down. Sounds fine, cool myth bro, but Plato never mentions how many people live on Atlantis, which would have really done a lot to make my life easier. Bizarrely, the mythical estimates for Atlantis's army ranges from 5 million to over 100 million, and everything in between. But regardless, those numbers give us a bit of an issue because the population of the entire world at the time in 10,000 BC would have been somewhere in the order of 1 to 3 million people. Adding insult to injury, Atlantis probably isn't even from 10,000 BC, because a mistranslation basically changed the entire story to 9,000 years ago when it was originally meant to be 900 years ago. So basically, TLDR were looking for some historical event that Plato could have based his clearly made up story on that he then used to pass off as if it were historically true to all his bros. So what historic clues can we find in Atlantis the movie? Well, the one thing we actually know is that there was a tsunami. So, we just have to find a massive historical tsunami at the right time and place to make this happen. And for that, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Minoan Civilization, located on the island of Crete and most prominent from about 2000 to 1500 BC. The Minoans are most famous for building palaces and being the inspiration for the myth of the Minotaur. But Minoans are also our best proxy for both Atlantis as Plato reported it, as well as how Disney imagined. It. The large buildings that we see present in Atlantis the Lost Empire would have been extraordinarily rare in the ancient world, but the Minoans were building palaces and multi-story buildings earlier than any other island civilization that we know of. The Minoan language also checks off the boxes from what we see in the movie. Nobody is really sure what Minoan sounded like because we can't read the basic Minoan writing system, known as Linear A, which parallels the fact that no one can read Atlantean in the movie itself. Yeah. Yes, yes, I can read Atlantean, just like you. You can't, can you? No one can. And most importantly of all, we have an event that would make sense for the quote-unquote sinking of Atlantis. Around 1550 BC, right around the real time Atlantis was supposed to be set without Plato screwing up his dates, the volcanic island of Thera, modern-day Santorini, exploded, destroying part of the island and sending gigantic waves to the shores of Crete, only about 70 miles away. The resulting tsunami devastated the coast of Crete, destroying cities, ruining coastline, and of course, killing a lot of people. Now, I hear ya, Atlantis is supposed to have sunk into the sea, and uh, Crete is still very much around. That said, part of the island of Thera sank. You can actually see where a bunch of it is missing even to this day. So the whole idea is still right that this event sunk an island and destroyed a civilization. So for God's sake, after all of that overanalysis, what the heck is the death count? Well, estimates have the eruption of Thera killing 35,000 Minoans on Crete. Wow. And that's to say nothing of the people who are on Thera itself. Even if we want to use a more conservative estimate, those estimates still still run in the range of 20,000 deaths, definitely enough to dwarf any of our other Disney contenders up to this point. So as devastating a historical event as this was based on, the silver lining here is that in the Disney version, there is no way Hercules can beat this, right? I mean, sure, houses are crushed, temples are blown away, but it can't measure up to the explosion of Thera, right? Except, interestingly enough, many people believe that the inspiration for the story of the Titanomachy, the exact scenes that we see take place in Hercules, was the massive eruption of Thera, the same event that we just attributed to the loss of Atlantis. So the long story short here is that the destruction in these two movies are based on the exact same event. So what is it? Like, a tie, then? I mean, effectively, for as much as we can calculate real numbers out of poorly documented historical facts that influenced fictional movies hundreds of years later, yeah. Although Hercules is taking place in Thebes, which is much farther away from Thera than Crete is, so there would be fewer deaths associated with Hercules just by proximity alone. And there you have it, Hercules and Atlantis practically in a tie. I mean, of the two, Atlantis would qualify as the more deadly movie with Hercules in second place, but the two of them have a commanding lead over anything else in the Disney canon that we've covered so far. Congratulations, Disney, on leveraging a devastating global event for children's entertainment. Not just once, but twice.
ways. But don't worry, I hear ya. A tie? What? You can't lead us through an entire flippin' trilogy on Disney movies and ruin Christmas and string us along through this ungodly long episode that has itself a flippin' mid-roll just to tell us that it ends in a tie. I mean, I don't write the movies, so take it up with old Walt. Oh wait, there is still one more. Dinosaur. That's right. The Disney feature you didn't know you needed, and then definitely continued to not need because it came out in 2000, and we already had the far superior Land Before Time series since 1988. But regardless, it's a movie that the Disney Animation Studios made, and it is here where the buck stops when it comes to Disney deaths. And I know, you're all like, oh, of course, this movie shows the extinction, right? So many millions of dinosaurs die. And as much as I'd like to just finally, finally end this, with the mass extinction of the dinosaurs, this movie actually doesn't show that event. I swear, that would have been the easy way out. But in the entire film, only five dinosaurs die. Two bad guys, two good guys, and one neutral triceratops. That's it. I know, I couldn't believe it either. But if that's the case, then where else could all the deaths come from? And the grand answer, the answer to where the most Disney deaths come from in the animation studio's 80-year history isn't coming from humans, isn't coming from fish, it's coming from lemurs. Yup. These guys. Prehistoric lemurs. And you might be thinking to yourself, gee, I didn't think dinosaurs and lemurs really lived at the same time, and right you would be. Pretty much. There's some research that mammals and dinosaurs did overlap for a very short time at the end of the Cretaceous period when Aladar, our Iguanodon protagonist, was supposed to have lived. And it just so happens that one of the oldest animal species to exist in this teeny overlapping sweet spot 60 million years ago were lemurs. And yes, historically you still have to really squint at this one to get any kind of scenario where a monkey family would raise a dinosaur. We're just gonna have to go with this one in order to make it to the other side of it. So like I said, Said, very few dinosaurs were actually harmed in the making of dinosaur, but an entire island worth of lemurs were just knocked out in one fell swoop. We see a meteor in the associated fallout land on the uncreatively named lemur island in the movie, sending the entire island up in flames except for this small lemur family and our friendly dinosaur hero. The lemur baby even comments that during the film, thereby confirming for us that every lemur on Lemur Island is now a crispy critter. But of course, that leads to the next obvious question, how in the world do we know how many that is, or even how big Lemur Island is? Well, in the most bizarre twist of luck, we actually know the real world location of Lemur Island, because historically there is only one possible location, and it's the real island off the east coast of Africa called Madagascar. In your biology lesson for the day, the reason lemurs are lemurs is because they evolved all by themselves over millions of years, isolated from all other primate species on the lonely island of Madagascar. All lemurs, even modern lemurs, started back on Madagascar. So this is literally the only place lemur island could be in the entire planet Earth, especially on the order of 60 million years ago when Madagascar had just started to separate from continents. Continental Africa. This is also why we only see the dinosaur and lemurs swimming across a narrow channel rather than a huge body of water in the aftermath of the meteor strike. At the time they escaped from Lemur Island, Lemur Island was just recently Lemur Peninsula. So with that incredible stroke of luck, we now know not only where Lemur Island is, but how big it is. Madagascar is 226,597 square miles in area, but not all of that area is habitable by lemurs. Going by its modern day geography, which is honestly all we got, only about 43,000 square miles of the island is rainforest, which is lemur habitat, and also the area where we see the lemurs living in the movie. So how many lemurs could reasonably be living in 43,000 square miles of jungle? Oh, well. This is impossible to know directly, but the lemurs in the movie would have been precursors to the modern ring-tailed lemur, which has a territory size of 0.14 square miles. That means that you could fit yourself 307,143 lemurs onto Madagascar at territory capacity, which is how many lemurs we would have the potential to lose in dinosaur, even if we said it was half 
that number. Even if we said it was a tenth that number, we still have our winner by a long shot. By an apocalyptic landslide, Dinosaur is the deadliest Disney movie of all time. Rest in peace, lemurs, and a moment of silence for all the Disney fallen who've gone before you. So after 58 movies and three incredibly long episodes, what does all this mean, my friends? We have come a long way on the Disney death train, and I wanted to highlight how much we've accomplished here by recapping some of our most significant findings. Across the entire Disney canon, 58 original Disney Animation Studio movies, our estimated total deaths are 344,031, which is Honestly, nothing compared to the number of childhood dreams this show kills on a regular basis. Our overall deadliest Disney movie winner is Dinosaur, at a death count of up to 300,000 sapient lemurs. The most deaths of any movie you cared about, or are likely to have seen, however, goes resoundingly to Hercules and Atlantis The Lost Empire, with over 20 to 30,000 deaths each by Volcano. Most deaths in a Disney princess movie, as well as Disney's deadliest princess, goes to Mulan with just over 1,200. Very respectable number. Disney's deadliest and most effective villain is Scar from The Lion King at 1,659 deaths. The 1,660th death was his own. Most twisted deaths go to Alice in Wonderland where the walrus eats 12 oyster babies. Most tragic death ends up going to the accidentally harpooned opera singing whale in Make Mine Music. God, just brutal sad. And my personal favorite Disney death goes to Ursula being stabbed in the stomach at the end of Little Mermaid. And now, finally, with this series over and all this being said, you can now go and we can all collectively kill off 2018 to start the old kill count back at zero for 2019. This has been an incredibly fun but totally exhausting project to finish off the year. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. This was a blast. Let me know if you want to do something similar for Pixar movies, DreamWorks movies, I don't know. I'm game for anything. Thank you so much for your support over this three-part trilogy. Thank you so much much for your continued support of Film Theory, and have a happy new year, everyone. Onward to 2019! I will see you there with more theories, more film theories, and cuts.